This conference will now be recorded. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining. Um, this is the PPI presentation called Plastic Piping Materials for Ground Source Geothermal Systems. Uh, this is a PPI presentation, and as you can see, PPI is an ASPE CEU provider and an ICC preferred education provider. Um, for those who don't recognize the voice, uh, this is Lance McNevin with PPI. I'm the Director of Engineering for PPI's Building and Construction Division. If we haven't met before, uh, I'm an alumni, alumnus of the University of New Brunswick as a mechanical engineer, and that's in eastern Canada. I've been involved with the piping industry since 1993, which doesn't feel that long ago, but I guess it was about 27 years ago or so. Um, Within PPI, I've got multiple roles. I represent a lot of our members on various technical committees within organizations shown here. I also participate in some ASHRAE technical committees, including TC 6.8, which is on ground source geothermal systems, and uh, participate in a group called the Hydronic Industry Alliance Commercial, the Radiant Professionals Alliance. And my contact information is shown here and will be shown again on the last slide if anybody needs to get in touch with me. Um, the important industry news that I gave a preview on before we officially began. Um, so speaking of IGSPA, one of the organizations of which I've been a member for a while, uh, you may have heard at previous PPI meetings that Oklahoma State University, which began the IGSPA organization um, 37 years ago, has decided to, uh, to transfer IGSPA to a new home. They went through a more than six month process of looking for the right new home for IGSPA. And it was announced just yesterday that they have selected the organization known as GEO, uh, the Geothermal Exchange Organization, based in Springfield, Illinois, I think, as the new home of IGSPA. Um, so that has been officially announced to all IGSPA members as of yesterday. Uh, PPI supports this move. Um, PPI is involved with with the GEO group. Uh, we know the owners of that organization quite well, and uh, we have offered our assistance to them with anything that we could do to assist with them um, getting the new version of HPA um, up and running well and quickly and uh, resuming it to, to growth mode, which it was in for many years. So, so we wish them well, and we support that decision of OSU. Um, in a normal version of this presentation that we're giving to outside audiences, people often do not know who is the Plastics Pipe Institute. So we have a few slides explaining who we are. We know that we have a lot of people on the webinar today that aren't necessarily normal uh, PPI meeting attendees. So I will uh, go through these slides as well, just so everybody knows who is PPI and what is our mission, what do we do. PPI was actually formed way back in 1950 in the early days of the plastic pipe industry in North America. And today we're a nonprofit trade association serving North America based in Irving, Texas. Our mission is to advance the acceptance and use of plastic pipe systems through research, education, technical expertise, and advocacy. And our members share a common interest in broadening the awareness and creating opportunities to expand market share and extend the use of plastic pipe in all its many applications. Uh, today we're lucky enough to have over 170 member firms um, supporting PPI in the work that we do uh, through their membership. And our website is shown at the bottom. PPI has five divisions that focus on solutions for multiple applications. Uh, everything related to geothermal is part of the Building and Construction Division, or BCD. Our other division names are also shown there. And within BCD, we focus on pressure pipe materials, those materials being PEX, CPVC, PERT, PEX aluminum PEX, polypropylene, and high-density polyethylene when used in geothermal applications. And that's kind of a family picture there um, of the different types of materials that we represent within BCD. And like I said, we focus on pressure piping applications, and that also includes plumbing, water service, fire protection, hydronic heating and cooling, snow and ice melting, district heating and cooling, um, and then of course today's topic, ground source geothermal piping systems. So as a bit of an introduction into exactly what we're talking about here today for ground source geothermal systems, it's an application that gets a lot of different descriptions and a lot of different names, 
but ground source geothermal is the is the name that we're going to mostly use here today. Um, ground source heat pumps, mechanical heat pumps connected to piping loops uh, in the ground outdoors, are really the most efficient source of heating and cooling energy for virtually any type of building. And we're comparing ground source geothermal systems with everything from air source heat pumps to traditional boilers, chillers, uh, variable refrigerant flow systems, rooftop units, and everything else. So it's going to take less energy to heat and cool a building with a ground source heat pump system as compared to virtually anything else that exists. Um, now, the basic premise um, and related to system benefits is that piping loops are exchanging heat with the earth, meaning drawing heat from the earth and rejecting and returning heat back to the earth when a building is in cooling mode. And by doing that, as opposed to trying to extract heat from the air or return heat to the air, one second. These geothermal heat pump systems can actually have efficiencies um, often expressed in a term coefficient of performance, or COP. Uh, overall system efficiency is greater than 450% when operating in heating mode. And what that means is for every one unit of energy put into the system, and that would be electricity to power the heat pump and circulating pumps, you can often get more than four and a half units of heat energy back out of the system. So pretty tremendous uh, overall system efficiency. And then in cooling mode, heat is going to be rejected back into the earth. Sorry about that, losing my voice for one second. There we go. And some other advantages of heat pumps is that the heat pump units themselves are indoors, they're out of sight, there's no noise outside your house. Um, and overall, these systems are going to deliver low operating costs with high reliability. So there is an image there, kind of an illustration of what we call horizontal ground loops, that image courtesy of IGPA. This next image is kind of an illustration of vertical ground loops. And then this image here is what's known as a submerged pond loop with pipes submerged in a pond. So there's different ways of executing geothermal, and we're going to be talking about those later in, in today's presentation as well. Um, part of the relevance why we want to talk about this here is a lot of you know that within PPI, we do a Project of the Year Award every year for each of the five PPI divisions. And in the last two years within our Building and Construction Division, our Project of the Year winners have actually been geothermal projects. So this is something that our members get involved with. We support this industry very heavily. And 2018, the winning project was called the Whisper Valley Net Zero Capable Community in Austin, Texas, uh, which is being built out with 237 homes using PIX-AW bins in a community geothermal system with a total of 313,000 feet of pipe uh, buried in the ground. And then for this year's most recent Project of the Year winner, it was a project known as the YV Air, YVR Airport Geo Exchange System, and that's the Vancouver International Airport. And the company Versa Profiles uh, was the winner of this year's award. And you'll hear more about it later when the actual case study gets published. But this system includes 841 vertical boreholes that are 500 feet deep with PE4710 piping loops uh, going down those boreholes um, and then a bunch of horizontal headers buried in the ground as well. So there's well over 840,000 feet of pipe in that system. And the designer, designers of this project are estimating that it's going to reduce their CO2 emissions by up to 40% as compared to traditional heating and cooling technology. So very important. Um, and then something that's coming up in the near future, if you're interested, there's a, an organization out there called the Deep Foundations Institute or the DFI, which really focuses on everything from design of structural piles to bridge foundations, building foundations. And every two years, they've been hosting um, a seminar called the Energy Foundation Seminar, which is really focused on using structural piles and bridge foundations and, and tunnels um, as heat exchangers to heat and cool the buildings above. And uh, so they have a, an event which was supposed to be in person, and it's being moved to a virtual event with presentations split over three days throughout July, um, July 8th, July 15th, and July 22nd. So it's done virtually this time, 
and they have invited PPI to return and give a version of today's presentation to the attendees of that conference. So I'll be doing a very short 20-minute version of today's presentation during that event. And in fact, that event two years ago um, was the first time that we had the, a chance to talk about geothermal systems at some conference, and that was kind of the basis of us forming this presentation in the first place. So that's some interesting background, hopefully. Let's get into the actual meat of the presentation itself. So this is the official outline. And we've got four learning objectives, or four main sections that we're going to be talking about here today. In the first one, which is the biggest and most important part, I think, we're going to be describing the plastic piping materials used for ground source geothermal systems. Um, and the materials we're going to talk about are high-density polyethylene, PEX, PERT, and polypropylene. And then we're going to discuss the industry standards that apply to those piping materials, which is obviously very relevant for a specifier or a designer. Um, third, we're going to be demonstrating various manifold and header techniques because there's multiple ways of connecting our, our various loops out through the ground. And then we're going to introduce a document from PPI called TN55 and some other industry resources that are available for designers, installers, and specifiers of these systems. A couple of kind of prelude slides or prologue slides. Uh, first of all, when it comes to systems that are installed in the ground, and especially those that are touching groundwater, it is important that they are uh, tested and certified to the standard known as NSF ANSI CAN Standard 61. So the materials that we'll be talking about today are certified to that standard for drinking water safety. Uh, and that also ensures that they would not contaminate any groundwater that they're in contact with. Some other very basic piping terminology uh, terms that we'll explain early on, um, and this sounds very fundamental, but sometimes we'll be talking about tubing and sometimes we'll be talking about pipe. Uh, both sizing systems exist in the piping world, uh, using the term generically when I say in the piping world. By tubing, we mean where the actual diameter is an eighth of an inch larger than the nominal size. That's also known as copper tube size. So some of our piping or tubing products are actually tubing, uh, whereas a lot of the others are actual pipe size materials, whereby the outside diameter matches that of iron or steel pipe of the same the same name. Um, so yeah, the terminology is CTS for copper tube size and IPS for iron pipe size. And then at some point, uh, through the literature, through the specifications, through, through the designs, you will hear the term dimension ratios, sometimes expressed as a standard dimension ratio. And the official definition of that is the ratio of outside diameter to wall thickness of a pipe, calculated by dividing the average outside diameter of the tubing or pipe by the minimum wall thickness. So some examples of how that terminology could be used is when we talk about PEX tubing today, that's actually going to be all an SDR9 product, which means the wall thickness is one ninth of the diameter. Uh, today, we're not going to be talking about CPVC tubing. That is not used in geothermal systems, but it is used in other piping applications. And most CPVC tubing is SDR11, where the wall thickness is one eleventh of the OD. And then when we talk about HDPE pipes today, those pipes could be SDR9, SDR11, 13.5, etc. Uh, typically, the de designers will select the wall thickness or wall type that they need to meet a certain pressure rating. And later on in the presentation, we'll show how PPI TN55 gives guidance towards selecting the right, uh, the right wall type. And then it's important for a lot of uh, specifiers and engineers to know that all plastic pipes, uh, tubing, and fittings have inherent safety factors for the intended applications based on prescribed design factors that are listed um, and explained within product standards. So there are many design factors. Uh, in a lot of cases, they will actually reduce the listed operating pressures by up to 50% as compared to what the products are ultimately capable of. Um, and this is getting into the weeds a little bit here, but certain PE4710 materials actually use a, a 0.63 design factor. So uh, I'm not going to get into that in great detail today. Most of the people on today's call are piping material experts, and you know this information, but we do tend to explain this to uh, designers in some of our presentations. All right, so let's really get into the meat of the system here. 
the meat of the presentation, I should say, which is going to be focusing on the piping materials, um, which are really critical to the success of the ground loop system, as you can imagine. Now, if you think about all the jobs that the pipe must do when buried in the ground and filled with pressurized fluid, they must provide corrosion resistance, chemical resistance, flexibility to be installed, impact resistance, resistance to slow crack growth in case they get scratched in the ground or gouged by a rock or something, long-term hydrostatic strength, that means their pressure capability, and temperature resistance. So not every pipe system in the world can actually deliver all of these requirements that we need. And in a little more detail, um, when it comes to pressure, these systems can experience changes in pressure of up to 60 PSI due to thermal expansion and contraction of the heat transfer fluid and the pipe itself. So as the fluid is heated up, the fluid will increase in volume, but then also the pipe expands too. But overall, you can actually go from a low range to a high range of possibly a 60 PSI pressure swing um, in these piping systems. And then similarly in temperature, uh, in some of these systems, you could be going from a low fluid temperature down to 25 degrees Fahrenheit in the coldest, uh, latest end part of the winter where you're extracting heat out of the ground and the ground is getting very cold uh, and you're extracting a lot of heat out of that fluid to a worst case situation where possibly the fluid you're returning back into the ground in air conditioning mode could be as hot as 115 degrees Fahrenheit. So obviously that, that temperature swing is not going to happen in the same day but over the course of a year, uh, you could actually see temperature swings of that much um, in, a given, in a given system. So, so the pipe has to withstand all of that and then also has to be actually uh, functional as a good heat transfer material because the main job of the pipe, it's not only to keep the fluid inside, but it's also to exchange heat with the earth surrounding the pipe, whether it be a horizontal berry directly buried in the ground or a vertical borehole with grout surrounding the pipe itself. So we ask a lot for the pipes, and there's really only a few materials out there that are proven and eligible to, to do this job. So that's what we're going to be talking about. And the first of these is known as high-density polyethylene. Um, HDPE, it's the most common type of piping material used in ground heat exchangers, really with decades of proven service. Um, throughout the 70s, when this technology first took off, people experimented with different types of pipes, even into the 80s. Um, but by the late 80s, 1990s, it was pretty much defined that HDPE was, uh, at that time, the, the best piping material available for this application. So it's been recognized in virtually all the codes and the standards as an approved material for uh, what's also known as the ground couple heat exchange piping system, also known as the ground loop. And it's a strong and tough material suitable for applications all the way up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit if the fluid would ever actually get that hot. The common types of HDPE which are used in geothermal systems go by material designation codes. And those most common types are known as PE3608 or PE4710. The image there that you'll see is a geothermal uh, coil fabricated with a molded U-bend at the midpoint. Um, and that's intended for dropping down into a vertical borehole. Here's a nice job site picture here with many of those HDPE coils um, being delivered to the project on large spools. And those spools will facilitate the dropping of the pipe down into vertical boreholes. This is obviously a large multifamily project. Some additional job site photographs here, the one on the left. Now we see the pipes laid out horizontally because typically these vertical boreholes are spaced out about every 20 feet apart from each other. You don't really want the vertical boreholes much closer than that to each other because then they'll start actually having influence on each other's temperature. So typical design guidelines uh, say to keep them about 20 feet apart from each other, which means you've also got um, hundreds or thousands of feet of horizontal pipes connecting all these vertical uh, ground loop pipes to each other and then bringing the fluid back into a mechanical room, uh, typically where the actual heat pumps are located in the mechanical room in the building. The image on the right then actually is showing um, a pipe loop being dropped down into a vertical borehole. And these vertical boreholes, sometimes they're 150 feet deep, sometimes they're 500 feet deep, um, sometimes even deeper than that. So some of, in some of these images, you will see very long coils of pipe uh, being delivered to the job site for the vertical boreholes. 
So as we mentioned, one of the important properties of the pipe is not only does it have to keep the fluid inside and be a strong pipe, but it also has to exchange heat with the earth. So for designers that are actually looking for the thermal properties of polyethylene pipe, they will find that information in the PE Handbook of Polyethylene Pipe on table E1. Um, that's where the specific heat values and thermal conductivity values of the different piping materials are, are, are published and listed. So, um, yeah, the engineers are often looking for that because the design engineers for these systems are typically using specialized software programs to do long-term energy modeling uh, where they can model exactly how much heat they can extract to and from the earth. Um, and that heat has to travel through the pipe wall and through the grout and through the ground material. Um, and they often do this energy modeling for years into the future, uh, sometimes up to 10 years into the future, possibly even more. With regards to connecting the HDPE pipes, um, the connections obviously have to be 100% uh, secure. So there are three technologies available for joining HDPE pipe. The first of these is known as butt fusion, where you uh, butt one pipe or one pipe to one fitting up to each other and do a heat fuse joint where you heat the surfaces and then force them together and the material welds by flowing from a pipe into a fitting or, or vice versa. And those joints are going to be um, manufactured in accordance with ASTM standard D3261. There are socket fusion joints whereby the pipe goes inside the fitting and that's kind of represented by the image on the lower left here. Those are produced to ASTM standard D2683. There are electrofusion joints. An electrofusion fitting is shown in the middle picture in this page, whereby the pipes go inside the fitting and the fitting has copper wires embedded in it. The fitting gets connected to an electric machine, which heats the fitting and melts it onto the pipe. Those fittings are produced in, in accordance with an ASTM standard known as F1055. Um, and then in all cases, the fusion joints need to be installed in accordance with ASTM practice F2620. So there's actually a lot of ASTM documents out there which are designed to help the engineer specify the proper way of building their systems with HDPE pipes and also help the installer to give them guidance in terms of doing this work correctly. Just a bit of a glimpse into ASTM F2620, what that's all about. It's known as the standard practice for heat fusion joining of polyethylene pipe and fittings. And that's the industry's practice for heat fusion. It was first published in 2006. Um, it has been updated lately. The latest edition is from 2019. So it's an ASTM standard that anybody can purchase. And it provides a lot of guidance and also a lot of drawings and photographs of what are visually acceptable and unacceptable welds. So it's very much a useful industry document. Uh, when it comes to u bends, we talked a little bit we talked a little bit before about uh, u bends. Sorry, was there a question? Okay. So if you're doing vertical boreholes, um, the 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 fluid's going to go down the pipe and has to make a quick uh, u u turn and come back the other pipe. And these vertical boreholes are often only four inches or five inches or six inches in diameter. So it has to be a very tight bend radius at the bottom of the borehole. And there's a few different ways of uh, creating those U-bends at the bottom of the piping loop going down the borehole. Um, the one on the left is a U-bend fabricated with two elbows that are butt fused to each other. And then the pipes are socket fused into the elbows. And the one in the middle picture and on the right picture is a molded HDPE U-bend that actually has fewer joints because it's molded as one piece and then heat fuse to two pieces of pipe. Here's, uh, in these images here, some other examples of what those U-bends can look like. And in this case, we're showing different diameters of pipes. Excuse me. Different diameters of pipes with different uh, sizes of the molded U-bends attached to the pipes requiring slightly different diameters of the borehole ultimately to, to be able to make the pipes fit down the hole. So that's the first material that we're discussing is HDPE. And we discussed it first because it's both alphabetically first and it's been utilized the longest uh, when it comes to, to uh, ground loop systems. The next material that we'll um, introduce is called PEX or cross-link polyethylene. Many of you are familiar with this material. 
Um, PEX was originally developed back in the early 1970s for radiant heating applications and then for potable water plumbing applications. And over the last 40 years or so, it's been widely used for other applications such as hydronics, snow and ice melting. And since 2008, it's been approved in the U.S. through IGSPA guidelines for, uh, for ground source systems. Um, it's obviously a strong and tough material as a HDPE, but with PEX, it's also suitable for applications all the way up to 180 degrees. Um, not very often would you need fluid temperature that hot on a ground source geothermal system, but there are some systems that are actually used for what they call borehole thermal energy storage, where maybe you take waste heat from a building and transfer it into the ground as opposed to blowing it into the air. Um, and you can do that through a piping loop and then utilize that uh, overheated ground temperature or extra heated ground temperature uh, to provide you a greater source of heat energy when wintertime comes. And there are also some communities out there that use um, thermal solar systems to harvest thermal energy, especially in the summertime when there's lots of sun, and transfer that heat into the ground, um, and in which case the fluid temperature can get up to 180 degrees. And in those cases, you can actually get your ground temperature well over 140 degrees so that you have a lot more heat stored in the earth when it comes time to enter heating mode. Anyway, PEX materials, which a lot of you are probably familiar with, uh, there are many uh, material designation codes that exist for PEX materials, but some common types that you'll see are known as PEX 1206 or PEX 3306. Here are some images of PEX on the job. Uh, these PEX pipes happen to be color gray. It's not always color gray. It could also be colored black or red or blue or white. Uh, but in these images, they happen to be colored gray images. Uh, the system on the left here is a very wide trench, so that's a horizontal system with multiple piping loops going out and back. You see there's three of them side by side. And then the image on the right-hand side is also a, um, a pipe trench, basically, with multiple pipe, lives, pipe loops going down through this common trench. The image on the left here is in sandy soil. A uh, very wide trench, a uh, very deep trench, as you can see, with multiple pipe loops, again, going down and back side by side, and then being backfilled by sand in this case, because that's what they have. And then the image on the right is from a very large project at a, at a Google location out of Mountain View, California, uh, where they've got hundreds of vertical boreholes. Um, and these are the PEX pipe loops that were assembled on the job site and straightened out before being dropped vertically down these, uh, down these pipe loops down these boreholes, I should say. When it comes to the thermal properties of PEX, uh, fortunately, we have this material also available through a PPI publication. In this case, it's PPI TR48, which was first published in 2014, which includes thermal conductivity values and uh, R values, if people are interested, for both PEX and PERT materials. PERT will be the next piping material that we talk about. So that information is available for the engineers considering PEX or PERT for their energy modeling uh, thermal conductivity analysis. When it comes to joining PEX, PEX is not joined in the same way as HDPE because the material is cross-linked and um, most of the molecules in PEX are actually cross-linked uh, to make a piece of PEX pipe, essentially uh, one very large mega molecule uh, with some, some uncross-linked molecules free to move. Um, through a fusion process, but most of the PEX connections are actually done through some sort of a compression system. Uh, the fitting in the left here is known as the cold expansion compression sleeve fitting system. Uh, that's produced to an ASTM standard called F2080. But the fitting on the right here is the same type of HDPE electrofusion fitting as is used with polyethylene pipe. And for some of the PEX tubing materials, those HDPE fusion fittings have also been tested and proven to be compatible uh, and reliable. So they, they are available. If you want to have an old plastic system and use HDPE fusion fittings, you just have to ask the pipe system, the pipe manufacturer, if their pipe material has been tested and certified for use with um, HDPE electrofusion fittings in accordance with ASTM F1055. A few other fittings here which are used in geothermal systems. Uh, the one on the left is a press sleeve PEX fitting system. It could be a metallic or a polymer fitting which goes inside the PEX tubing and then the stainless steel sleeve is pressed around the tubing to compress it over the insert portion. 
Those are made in accordance with ASTM 3347. And the one on the right is called a cold expansion PEX fitting with a PEX ring. Those are made in accordance with ASTM F1960. So there are several options available, and it really depends on which piping system the, uh, the contractor selects. When it comes to fabricating the U-bends for PEX, there's a variety of ways to do it. Um, at least one PEX manufacturer actually makes a prefabricated U-bend. Uh, the version on the left for the one-inch tubing actually has a continuous U-bend of pipe where the pipe is actually heated and formed into a continuous U-bend and then encased in these white polyester um, housings that have these notches in them to make it easy to do a double U-bend with one nested inside the other, uh, also known as the resin tip. And then the version on the right, where it's larger diameter tubing, uh, too large to be bent tightly into a continuous U-bend and fit down a typical borehole, that's actually using some stainless steel compression sleeve fittings, which are joined to the individual pieces of PEX tubing and then encased in a waterproof uh, coating, a proof for direct burial. The next piping material we'll talk about is PERT. And PERT is an HDPE material with enhanced capabilities to withstand higher temperatures. This material has a 35-year history of successful use in the European market and was introduced in North America first a little more than 10 years ago for heating applications. It's also a strong and tough material and suitable, like PEX, for applications up to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the interesting thing about PERT is that it can also be joined via heat fusion, like polyethylene pipes or compression fittings, like PEX tubing. The common types of PERT material that we'd find uh, if we're using the material designation codes are known as PE2708 or PE4710, but you could specify those as PERT materials to get the higher temperature rating. And everything else about uh, PERT is the same in the sense that it would be used with the same types of fused fittings as HDPE or mostly the same types of compression fittings as, uh, as PEX would be utilizing. Now the fourth piping material that we're going to be introducing is known as polypropylene. And there are two types of polypropylene uh, known as PPR, random copolymerized polypropylene, or PPRCT, which is officially known as polypropylene random copolymer with modified crystallinity and temperature resistance. Now, both of these materials are not coming on coils. They're not flexible. Uh, they're not going to be typically dropped down into a vertical borehole or something like that. In the geothermal world, where we mostly find the use of polypropylene is as headers or manifolds inside a mechanical room. Um, these materials can also be joined using heat fusion processes, so socket fusion fittings uh, made to the same ASDM standard called F2389 that the pipes are produced to. So they get heat fused to each other, either prefabricated in a shop or heat fused in the field, and they can be used to make a variety of headers um, or other types of large manifold devices. And again, there's a wide range of shapes and sizes available for, for PERT, sorry, for polypropylene. So just to kind of summarize um, our information on the piping materials, uh, it's really four different materials. Uh, each of them has their place in the geothermal world. Each of them has their advantage for geothermal applications. So that's why four different ones exist. Um, and so, yeah, they all, they all have their place. They all have their advantages. So with that, we're going to wrap up the first learning objective of this presentation and uh, just really summarize by, by stating again that each of these materials is providing the basic elements of performance that you need for ground loop piping. And that means corrosion resistance, chemical resistance, because there's going to be typically some sort of antifreeze fluid um, inside the pipe, flexibility, impact resistance, resistance to slow crack growth, long-term hydrostatic strength, and temperature resistance as well as good thermal conductivity. So all of those piping materials will deliver those, deliver those requirements. Now, when it gets into the standardization of these materials, we want everybody to know that these materials are highly standardized and proven through decades of use around the world. Uh, we often get the question about life expectancy of these plastic pipe materials because it's a big investment 
typically the most expensive part of installing uh, a ground source heat pump system is the piping loop. Um, now, the biggest part of the cost is not the pipe itself. It's typically the labor. There's a lot of labor involved with putting the pipe in the ground. But if you're doing a 500-foot vertical borehole where the pipes are dropped down in one big continuous loop uh, with the U-bend at the bottom and then grouting material is pumped in around the pipe from the bottom to the top, um, if that pipe ever failed, you're not getting it back out again. So these pipes have to perform, and people expect them to perform for many decades. So the good news is the life expectancy of these materials, when installed according to industry and manufacturer's guidelines, is typically well in excess of 50 years. Now, these long-term pressure ratings are going to be based on an ASTM test method, and these materials, as we'll find, are listed in accordance with a PPI policy known as PPI TR3. And we'll provide a little more information on what these ASTM uh, standards are and what PPI TR3 is all about in a few minutes. And it's also important to know that these materials can be uh, specified and tested through rigorous product standards with detailed testing requirements. Um, and there are specific certification programs to ensure consistent quality control for the pipe and fitting systems used for these ground loops. Now, when it comes to the importance of proper standards, um, we try to make it easy for the engineers to just copy a suggested model specification that we'll provide and put that into their project specs, um, as opposed to allowing the engineer or giving the engineer the responsibility to create his or her own project specification. Because the problem with uh, engineers who may not be pipe experts uh, being put in a position where they have to create their own project specification is they may look at all the different product materials out there and all the different industry standards out there and try to try to create a generic specification that multiple materials can satisfy. Um, but that can result in a few things. It can cause confusion with manufacturers if they merge things together that, that don't quite work together. Um, they could be specifying out of date or inappropriate standards uh, that don't exist anymore or that potentially increase the cost or allow products to be actually inadequate according to today's capabilities. And in some cases, they can actually uh, merge different requirements together in a way that creates uh, the need for products that don't exist. And we sometimes refer those to Frankenstein, Frankenstein specifications, which is meant to be a mixture of the best of this person and the best of that person merged together, right? Um, and we know how that worked out. So we try to make it easy for the engineers to specify good ground loop materials by providing some suggestions. And that's the part of this learning objective coming up here. The first thing we're going to be referring to are, are a group of NSF standards known as the 358 standards. And these have existed for some time now. Uh, the 358 standards are a series of standards specifically designed for geothermal ground loops. So in addition to requiring the pipes to meet all the regular requirements that a pipe must meet in terms of long-term strength and short-term strength and, and dimensions and things like this, the pipes also have to be proven to be compatible with antifreeze mixtures. And the pipe and fitting systems also have to go through tensile pull-out tests uh, to make sure that the, the fitting systems, the connections will survive certain types of pull-out tests. But these standards have been around long enough now that the manufacturers of each of these material types that we talked about earlier um, has its own NSF 358 standard to which they can get their product certified. So that's 358-1 for HDPE, 358-2 for polypropylene, 358-3 for PEX, or 358-4 for PERT systems. So with regards to uh, some suggested language for each of these piping materials, Here's what our industry recommends if the engineer wants to specify HDPE materials. And you can copy this. Please do. Uh, what we suggest to say is that all, all HDPE pipe and fittings shall be manufactured from a PE compound with a minimum pipe material designation code of PE3608 when evaluated in accordance with ASDM D3350 and a minimum hydrostatic design stress value of 800 PSI at 73 degrees F. Now, piping materials such as PE4710 will easily meet this and will actually exceed these requirements. And if an engineer wants to specify only PE4710, you can do that as well. The second bullet that we recommend including 
is to say that the pipe shall comply with one or more of the following product standards, and that's ASTM D3035, ASTM F714, or CSA B137.1, depending on, I suppose, which side of the border you're on, and also to specify that all HDPE pipe and fittings shall meet the requirements of NSF 358-1. And if you specify those three things right there, you're going to get very high quality system, uh, well tested and certified for geothermal applications. Similarly for PEX, the language is not going to be exactly the same because in some cases PEX uh, well, certainly has its own standards and in some cases its own ways of defining its, its strength. But this is our suggested language for PEX systems. Uh, in the first bullet, we're talking about the tubing itself. And in the second bullet, we're referring to industry standards. The first one, F876, is for tubing. The third one, CSA B137.5, is also for tubing. But if the engineer wants to specify a pipe-sized PEX, then uh, he or she should refer to ASTM F2788, in which case you could get IPS-sized PEX. It's not widely available. There is not a lot of F2788 IPS-sized PEX available in North America today. Um, but that would be the standard that you would refer to if you wanted IPS size pipes. And then you could also require that all the PEX tubing and fittings shall meet the requirements of NSF 358-3. For PERT, here is our su suggested language. I'm not going to read all through it again because um, it's in a very similar format as to the HDPE uh, suggested specification language. And for polypropylene, um, suggested specification language is a little bit different because the standards for polypropylene evaluate long-term strength a little differently than we do for um, HDPE, PEX, and PERT, but the language on the slide is organized in the same way. So if you copied these three bullets, uh, you would get a well-specified polypropylene piping system. So that's our main advice, and certainly there's other language out there that you can pull from uh, through some industry standards that we'll look at here. Um, and that's the next thing that we're going to be talking about is getting into some of these industry standards in a little, little more detail, just so everybody's aware of these. And the first of these that we'll speak of is called the IGSPA Design and Installation Standards. This is a document that has been published for many, many years. Uh, it used to be updated slightly or at least reviewed and reaffirmed every year by the IGSPA organization. I believe the last edition of this was 2017, and it has been not been updated ever since then. Um, it, in, it, it does include HDPE and PEX materials. It does not include PERT or polypropylene materials. And it was the decision of IGSPA several years ago that they would essentially retire this document, stop updating it, um, in, in reference to a new CSA document, which is intended to take its place. And we'll address that new CSA document in a moment. There are two different IATMO codes that have to do with specifying geothermal systems. So again, if you're a specifier and you would like to say systems shall be installed in accordance with something, uh, you could quote the Uniform Solar Hydronic and Geothermal Code. This code under this name was first published in September 2018. And chapter seven of this code is all about geothermal energy systems. And it includes requirements for installation, the piping materials themselves, uh, testing, and additional details, including the fluid types and things like that. So that is known as the 2018 USHGC code. And as you see, chapter seven on geothermal energy systems. Similarly, the IATMO code, known as the Uniform Mechanical Code, uh, has recently been, on, been updated. The latest edition of this is the 2021 edition, which was released in March of this year. And in this updated code, Appendix F is on geothermal energy systems. And for the most part, uh, Appendix F of this code is harmonized with the Chapter 7 of the previous code that we just looked at but they're not identical because one of them is always newer than the other. So right now, the latest industry language for MyAtmo is in the Uniform Mechanical Code, Appendix F. 
So there's also the CSA code, uh, formerly known as ANSI CSA IGSPA C448, which was a binational document developed over several years by people from Canada and the U.S. representing many organizations and interests, engineering community, design community, installation community, manufacturers, um, and it's an ANSI designated binational consensus standard for both design and installation of ground source heat pump just systems. Um, it has existed, like I said, for uh, almost four years now, or a little bit over four years now. It's not necessarily adopted in a lot of jurisdictions yet, uh, but that's something that I believe the new version of IGSPA will be working to do, is putting the committees together uh, to get this standard adopted as code in various jurisdictions across Canada and the U.S. So the summary of this part of the presentation today is that it's important to properly select and specify the correct type of ground loop piping materials using current industry products and correct specific language to avoid misunderstandings with suppliers and installers. Um, each of the plastic piping materials used for ground loops can be specifically specified, if that's a proper term of words to use, um, and that the use of and reference to the IATMO codes or CSA C448 will help to ensure proper design and installation of geothermal systems. So hopefully that makes sense. We have a little more to go here, about 10 minutes left. Uh, the third part of this presentation is going to be on manifold and header techniques. And this is going to go fairly quickly, but we do want to make sure that everybody knows the options that you have for manifolds and headers because most ground source systems require more than one loop of pipe in the ground. Um, if we talk about a system with 10,000 feet of pipe in the ground, that is not a 10,000 foot loop of pipe. Uh, as you can imagine, with fluid traveling through a continuous 10,000 foot loop of pipe, the pressure loss would be tremendous and uh, the heat exchange would uh, reach its, point, reach its uh, you know, asymptote, its point of no return after the first portion of that. So we split our piping loops up into multiple separate loops. And there's typically three separate or distinct configurations that we use for organizing and connecting all these pipe loops. And these are known as reverse return, which is preferred for balance flow, series, which is generally avoided due to high pressure loss, and parallel or home run, where each ground loop is piped individually to a central header or manifold in a collection vault in the ground or in the building mechanical room or mechanical space, wherever that may happen to be. So we'll give some examples. Um, in this uh, basic sketch here, what we're looking at is a reverse return in-ground buried header system employing several pipe diameters to connect four vertical boreholes spaced equally apart. And there's no valves in any of a system like this because it's all buried underground. This is kind of like plan view, looking at it from space. Um, and the principle of sizing our pipes correctly is that we want the flow to be equal through each of these four borehole loops. So imagine each borehole loop was 300 feet deep. That means there would be 600 feet of pipe. So the pressure loss through each borehole loop is the same, but we want to make sure that the way we connect the borehole loops using larger and smaller pipes and reducing T's and whatnot, uh, make sure that the same flow rate goes through each of those borehole loops. Because if not, if we don't balance this correctly, and we have too much flow going through the first one and not enough flow going through the last one, then ultimately we may um, overutilize the first borehole, meaning extracting too much heat out of the ground over a winter or returning too much heat into it over the summer uh, while underutilizing the other boreholes, not getting enough flow. So these systems are typically built with uh, a lot of what they call step up, step down T's, uh, maybe four different diameters of pipe in a system like this. Uh, to get the flow to balance itself out. So there's a lot of designing involved to build one of those systems correctly. Here is a job site photo here. It's not necessarily laid out over many, many feet in the ground, but in this case here, the reverse return header uh, was assembled fairly close to each other using a variety of T's to kind of branch off in, in multiple directions. Now, when it comes to parallel distribution manifolds, also known as mechanical manifolds, these are typically located in building mechanical spaces or exterior collection vaults buried in the earth. 
but that means that the manifold itself is not backfilled with earth. Um, it's always accessible. People can get to it to adjust valves. A lot of these actually have valves on each supply and return for each individual loop. So a loop could be isolated if it needs to be. Uh, let's say you've got 24 loops out there, and for some reason somebody drilled a hole through one of them. Maybe he was the Verizon guy coming to run new fires through the property, and he punctured one of the one of the pipe loops. Um, if you didn't have valves, then you could uh, lose the whole system, meaning you would have to shut the whole system down until you located where that puncture was, which could take many, many days. Whereas if you were using, using a mechanical header like this one with valves, uh, you may be able to isolate which of the loops was punctured, just close those valves off, but the rest of the system would still be able to continue a normal operation. So there's a lot of advantages to using uh, manifold systems like this. Here's a few other examples here. On the image on the left, we see some vaults buried in the ground outside a project, and then the covers go in those vaults. Um, but what's inside those vaults are some polypropylene headers with valves, and in this case, there's even balancing valves. If you can see some of the big black things, that's insulation over balancing valves. So in case your ground loops weren't all the same length, you can actually balance the flow so that uh, they all get the right amount of flow. And the one on the right is also using polypropylene materials, and in this case, mounted inside a concrete vault uh, with multiple piping loops going out from those two different um, parallel headers. There are some other types of distribution centers that can be made, uh, fabricated out of polyethylene, uh, is how it's awfully done, often done. Uh, many pieces of polyethylene with fittings and valves fused together, so it could be an old plastic system constructed similarly as uh, what we're looking at here. Um, and sometimes, yes, those are going to be encased in other types of vaults out on the ground. Uh, we do have a few other pictures we'll be showing in a second. Um, but to summarize really quickly, uh, we just wanted to give a kind of a quick introduction in terms of what is meant by reverse return series and parallel or, or home run. Now, the fourth learning objective of this course in our remaining five minutes is to introduce PPI documents and resources uh, to help explain how these systems work and what resources are available. So the first thing we're going to introduce is a document that was published just over two years ago in early 2018. Known, known as TN55, um, it's the 55th, 55th PPI technical note that has been published up to that time. It's known as Plastic Piping Materials for Ground Source Geothermal Heating and Cooling Applications. And uh, on the left-hand side are some of the important sections that you'll find within that document. So I'm just going to show a few screenshots to give you an idea. Uh, the document does talk about different types of piping configurations to help people visualize how pipes are actually installed in the earth. In section 3.1.2, we talk about vertical piping systems and both single and U-bend configurations with some little sketches there to allow people to visualize what's going on there. Uh, we talk a little bit about pipe and pipe coaxial vertical systems. Those are not widely used in North America. They're more widely used in Europe, but people have done experiments with them in North America. They do exist, and they do use our plastic piping materials. Uh, sometimes people are using helix piping systems where you try to fit a lot of pipe into a shorter but wider hole in the ground. Uh, sometimes people are using inclined or angled configurations where maybe you don't go vertically straight down, but you start at a common point and then fan out in multiple directions. Um, and maybe that works because you just can't move your equipment uh, to many different places on the job site, so you keep your equipment at one local place and then fan your pipes out in multiple directions from there. So these are the kinds of things that are shown in this TN55. There is an entire section on ground loop uh, piping materials uh, with a section on each of the piping materials that we talked about today, what the pressure ratings would be for these piping materials and things like that. And there is a whole section also on um, headers and manifolds with some really nice illustrations that were donated to PPI by a member company showing underground vaults with headers built into them. So a lot of good information in PPI TN55. We should also let you know that on the PPI website, this is a screenshot of our website, if you click on the Applications tab, 
that's the third word from the left where it says applications, it'll bring up a group of applications for which our products are used. And one of those applications is on ground source geothermal. Um, and so if you click on that one, you'll get a whole page of information about ground source geothermal systems and links to other documents, such as TN55 and additional things. Uh, when it comes time to sizing the piping for your pressure loss and head loss in the systems, we have a tool known as the Plastic Pressure Pipe Design Calculator, available at plasticpipecalculator.com, or you can get to it through the PPI website, which allows you to select a pipe type and diameter and a flow rate and a fluid type and a fluid temperature, and then calculate what your uh, pressure loss will be through that piping loop. So that's important for designers to be able to know how to access. So some pretty good resources. There's other things available, but that's a bit of a uh, a bit of a summary in terms of what we want people to know is available from PPI. So with that, that kind of wraps up our presentation in terms of the four main learning objectives that we set out to address at the beginning. Um, and that brings us to the very end of the presentation at a screeching halt very quickly. Um, but I did want to finish on time, and it is exactly uh, one minute before the top of the hour, so. Uh, so at least we achieved that. Um, I'm welcome and uh, happy to stay on. If anybody has any Q&A, any questions for us, I'm happy to go ahead and open the floor up. I don't think you're automatically muted. So does anybody have any any questions for us today or any comments? Um, one thing I will say and was also addressed in the invitation that went out for today's presentation is for many of you, this might be the first time you're seeing this presentation. Um, if you're in this space, in this industry, and you have some better pictures to share, and you want to give us permission to use your images, please go ahead and email them to me. We'd be happy to include them and give credit to your company with a little courtesy company name as shown on the screen here right now. Uh, if you noticed anything in the presentation that may have been out of date or obsolete or not perfectly worded, also let us know about that, and we'd like to update these. Uh, the good thing with a presentation is that they're easy to update um, and to constantly keep it, keep getting them better and better. So again, I will stay on the phone for a couple more minutes in case anybody has any questions or comments. I am seeing some chats. But if there are no comments from anybody then, well, thanks everybody for your time today and for attending. Uh, again, we like to take these existing presentations that we have and share them with our members um, however we can. So we'll probably be doing a different one of these next month in July. So stay tuned and look for a new invitation soon for next month's um, delivery of an existing PPI BCD presentation. And with that, we are officially in the second half of the week. So have a good rest of the week, everybody, and thanks for your attendance. Bye-bye. Thank you, Lance. Perfect commentary. All the best. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everybody.